Thank you. Can, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. awesome, okay. Uh, I wanna start just by saying thank you for coming to the talk. It's an incredible honor to be sharing our writing process on Life is Strange Before the Storm at GDC, and I'm really excited to be here. Okay, so productive dissension. How a diverse writer's room created Life is Strange Before the Storm. This is gonna be a post-mortem of our process integrating narrative design and writing using a uh, kind of TV model of a collaborative writer's room and crafting our 1500 page script for Before the Storm. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. That looks better. Okay. Introduction. My name is Zach Aris. I'm a writer, game designer, narrative consultant. I've been working in the industry on and off for about 18 years. I got my first job in publisher side QA for Electronic Arts. I worked on a game called Majestic. I'm just curious, does anyone in the, in the room remember Majestic? I see a couple hands. Yeah. It was kind of an intermedia uh, storytelling game. The logline was It Plays You. <laughs> my last project, I was a lead writer on Life is Strange Before the Storm. I led a team of four writers in the production of the script. For those of you who might not know, I can't believe I, I can say this. Before the Storm is now a BAFTA-nominated prequel to the BAFTA-winning Life is Strange that came out in 2015. Thank you. It's crazy. Before working on Life is Strange, I was on a show called Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, a primetime crime procedural. Before that, I was a narrative designer on Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. How many people played Reckoning are familiar with it? That's awesome. It was an open-world combat RPG. Before writing and designing on Reckoning, I worked on two other open-world RPGs that were never released. Welcome to game development. <laughs> At university, I studied classics, ancient lit, ancient history, Latin, ancient Greek, and I published academic work that I guarantee you no one in this room has read. Okay, a writer's room in its most reductive shape, a whiteboard of some type where you can put information in a public space that everyone can look at and think about. You can use it to frame your conversation. A bunch of writers and a lead writer. Writer's room is kind of a weird thing. Writing is a very individualistic creative endeavor. And here we, we take a room and we bring a bunch of writers who would be working on their own into a space not even to write. You don't even write in a writer's room. You just talk about writing. You talk about story. What do you produce with this process? We talk about something called the break. At a really high level, it's an outline that seeks to explain the constituent beats of a story. So some character does something, another character feels a way about it. Maybe we have gameplay, narrative, pity, fear, a boss battle, catharsis, and that's a rough outline. That's really all you need. We'll spend hours, days, weeks, months creating a break that writers can then take into their own writing practice to work on whatever element of the story that they're developing, whatever scene, whatever fragment of a scene. Writers write their components individually, but we break together. We do that so that we frame a collective understanding that's sort of uni uniformly calibrated around the vision of the story. So even when John's writing the first scene and Felice is writing the last scene of an episode, they're doing so with a mind toward each other's work and the cohesive vision of the whole. The break might not be the only thing we're talking about in the room, though. We might spend a few hours just talking about a character like Chloe. What's her arc in this scene? What's her arc in this episode? What kinds of choices are we giving the player in how to perform Chloe as a character? And how do those different choices intersect with our story in productive or non-productive ways? We might spend a day talking about a theme like grief, an environment like Arcadia Bay, elements of our story like race and gender, and because we're also designers at Deck Nine, we talk about the gameplay mechanics we're using in developing the story as the player is seeing it through their eyes. Why do it? I'm gonna admit that sometimes and maybe even often, working in a writer's room is frustrating and difficult. And the title of my talk, Productive Dissension, I think speaks to this idea that a healthy room is a room that has multiple voices and perspectives, but inherent in that is conflict. You want to discuss ideas contentiously. 
You want to be critical of each other's perspectives because at the end of the day, it's all about the work. It's about making the work as good as it can be. And a writer's room, despite all these difficulties that accompany it, can produce something really special. Having a plurality of voices will let you leverage the diversity of your team in a way that will protect your script and your story and your game from any one person's blind spots. I'm the lead writer on Before the Storm. I have never been a 16-year-old girl. But half my writing team has. And when they have a voice in the construction of Chloe as a character, that's going to make Chloe better. A room has the ability to produce high-quality content quickly enough to keep up with your production team, to feed the beast, as it were. Game schedules are excruciatingly difficult at times. One writer will have a lot more difficulty composing content quickly enough on a narratively driven game to, to keep your content pipeline flowing. A team can do it fast. And to the quality of the work, a good room, a really healthy room, can essentially Voltron a group of writers into becoming one super writer. And if you don't know who Voltron is, it's this guy. He's basically a giant sword-wielding robot composed of individual robot cats. <laughs> All right, so the crux of my talk. This is my argument. I'm going to suggest that to build a really great room, you need three things. You need what I call an etiquette of exchange. You need a vocabulary and a methodology for talking about complex story work in a way that your team shares and understands and that can do the work in a room, that can have conversations in a room that are different from the conversations you have in other spaces. You need a culture of transparency, which is to say that every voice in the room can speak and will be heard. And every member of the room is deliberate in paying attention to their peers' perspectives. And if you have those first two, you also need a mechanism in place for actually making decisions. It's pretty easy to spend a lot of time talking about story and accomplishing very little. OK, so what do I mean by an etiquette of exchange? Let's look at virtually any kind of room with people in it. Not a writer's room, just a space where people are near each other. They think about different things, like work, food, sex, fake news, <laughs> Mario Odyssey. This is, this is human nature. We're islands unto ourselves. We're little universes running around, colliding with each other in effective and ineffective ways. A writer's room tries to suspend what's normal, to, tries to bridge those islands so that for a window of time, we can all focus on one thing, and every individual's talent and experience and skill set can be leveraged for that one thing. All right, so here's a writer's room. We have our lead writer in red. We have the whiteboard. Guys, I want to talk about Voltron. <laughs> yeah, Voltron's cool. He's that sword-wielding robot composed of individual robot cats. I know about that guy. <laughs> Voltron's awesome. He's a giant. He's got a giant sword. He's got cat feet. <laughs> Voltron sucks. I don't get it. Why would individual cats make a giant dude? Why wouldn't they make a giant cat? Why can't cats have swords? <laughs> no, no, you're missing the point. Voltron's a metaphor for what we're doing right now. It's incredible. Something that's stronger than the sum of its parts. I like Care Bears. <laughs> so this is a writer's room in action. And up until the Care Bear comment, we saw a certain kind of eti etiquette of exchange at work. The lead writer's framing the discourse. Guys, today I want to solve the Voltron problem. We need to talk about it. And in that, the lead writer is seeking to curate a very specific discussion with a problem in mind. You want to go into the room with a problem that you want to solve. And the lead writer is saying, OK, guys, this is what we're going to focus on. And each of the individual staff writers are striving to contribute to that solution. And I think for it to really work, they need to curate what's coming out of their mouth as they speak. And then we have the Care Bear guy. It's probably one of the most common mistakes I see junior writers make in a room. You're excited to be there. You've never done it before. You're surrounded by writers who are probably more experienced than you are. And the, and the conversation that's happening is really exciting. And at a certain point, you have a, you have a lightning bolt. And you're like, oh my god, Care Bears. I want to contribute. I want to say my Care Bear thing. And so you sit there for five minutes waiting for a lull in the conversation. And then people are quiet, and you're like, Care Bears. <laughs> And when I see it, I call it out, because this is how you make junior writers more experienced writers. And I say, oh my god, Care Bears, really? You think we should stop talking about Voltron and start talking about Care Bears? Tell me why. 
And often it's like, oh, I didn't, I don't know that we want to do that. I just thought Care Bears are cool and I wanted to contribute something. This is the work of the lead writer in the room. It's having to decide whether to talk about Voltron or Care Bears. But in, in seriousness at all times, what you're doing with a team, a good team of writers, they're full of imagination and they have ideally the experience and the talent to tackle any narrative problem you've got. And you light the fuse, you introduce the problem, and you let them go. And you're courting a whirlwind of ideas. And a great lead writer can navigate that whirlwind with uh, a decisiveness, with an intention. And what you have to constantly do as you're doing that is listen to what your writers are saying and how they're contributing and developing, iterating on the idea, and clarify and focus them as you go. It's really easy to talk a lot about something like Voltron or Care Bears or Chloe Price for hours and hours and walk out of the room at the end of the day with less clarity around the problem you were trying to solve than you had at the beginning. Having a structure in place that lets you discuss productively is key to this. The other part that's kind of inherent to this process is contention. We saw how heated that dialogue got around Voltron. When we're talking about things like LGBT themes or grief, such a personal idea, or what it's like to be a teenager, I ask my writers to really invest their work and the conversation with themselves. I want them to passionately talk about their perspective on the issue, and they're going to disagree with each other. How do you do that? How do you have a dialogue uh, in a group that can become so contentious around, around socially charged issues um, and, and make it fruitful, let alone pleasant to engage in? So as an anecdote. When I joined the Criminal Minds team, I was hired by Erica Messer. She's the showrunner for Criminal Minds. And she told me when she was interviewing me that she has one rule that she uses to sort of evaluate who she brings on board every staffing season, from an uh, assistant writer position all the way to an executive producer. When she's building her rooms, she's got one rule. No assholes. And it's kind of silly and funny, but it's really true. There's an alchemy to a healthy room that's able to passionately argue drawing from their own personal experiences without making the argument about each other. And for me, it comes down to kindness and humility. And I hire writers with that in mind. That's really important because it, it, it keeps the conversation about the work, and that's what it should be. Ego and sensitivity, um, the kind of writer who hears criticism of an idea and really feels like it's criticism of them, they might not be the best kind of writer for, for a writer, writer's room. Okay, so let me talk about my team for a second. The writers who wrote Life is Strange Before the Storm. John Zimmerman, he's 32 years old. He's a bachelor's in Brandeis in journalism and creative writing. He has an MFA from USC in film production, one of the best film schools in the world. Prior to working on Before the Storm, he wrote and directed a bunch of his own indie projects. And this was what really caught my eye when I was interviewing him. He taught interactive fiction in enrichment programs for children. Felice Kwan, 34, bachelor's from Princeton in mathematics, MA from Harvard in education, MFA from NYU in musical theater composition. So she's obviously a dummy. <laughs> she taught SAT and ACT prep. She's tutored mathematics. She's an extensive LARPer, and she loves to write and read YA fiction. Mallory Littleton, she's 21. She's currently in school, pursuing an associate's degree from Colorado Film School in film production with an emphasis in screenwriting. Mal has done everything you can do on a film set. She watches and plays everything she can, and she hates pretty much all of it. <laughs> I want to talk about really two things, point out two things related to my team. The first is that, particularly for John and Felice, prior to working on Before the Storm, they were teachers. And that was really important to me, because education is a wonderful space where you learn how to break down complex ideas using simple language, and you develop a sensitivity sensitivity to your listener to discern whether or not they understand what you're saying. That was a whole toolkit they could bring out of the gate into the room that really helped us develop uh, the right kind of conversation. The other thing that I want to point out is that none of the writers on Before the Storm shipped a game prior to working on this one. They're really an extraordinary group. I couldn't be more proud of, of what they've done. Okay, enough mushy stuff. So, 
Second element I've claimed is critical to building a really great room, a culture of transparency. What I'm talking about here is a recognition within the space that it's important that everybody has a voice and that everybody pays attention and listens to each other. This comes down to room stewardship. This is not something that happens on its own. It's kind of counterintuitive how to talk, how to, how to productively dissent. And it comes down to the lead writer's responsibility in framing this. Now, I think it goes without saying that a, a toxic lead writer will create a toxic room. But often challenges that rooms find, don't, they don't come from the lead writer. They come from junior writers because they don't know better because this is hard. So I think it's the, the lead writer's responsibility to be highly critical of the behavior of their team. I was in a room once where I saw one writer roll their eyes at something another writer said, and it was a personal thing. And I called them out on it immediately. Not cruelly, not wanting to be vindictive in any way, but because it's really important that kindness and humility is actively present in the discourse, especially when you're writing a game like Life is Strange that's really trying to tackle socially significant and personal issues. So I would, I would encourage lead writers to really thoughtfully shape the culture of your room and how you're talking, how you're listening to each other, and be highly forgiving as you go. There's no shame in calling someone out on something they didn't know they shouldn't do. And as the lead writer, if you're driving the ship, you have to be really great at receiving criticism yourself. I demand from my writers that they challenge my ideas and my direction when they feel it's appropriate. That's why I want them in the room with me, so that they can help me work past my blind spots. So I have this mechanism I call the make your case rule. I'm the lead writer in my room. I'm driving the direction of the break. We're talking about Chloe and the junkyard processing, which just happened in a conversation with Rachel. I want to take one direction, and maybe John wants to take another. I need him to say to me, Zach, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think we really want Chloe to be in a, a lower register of emotion. Don't you think that'll be stronger for the story? And I'll ask him, okay, that's an interesting idea. Tell me why that's better. Tell me what work that does. And it's this kind of covenant we have. My commitment to him is that I'm going to listen to what he has to say, and I'm going to critically evaluate the idea. And then I'm going to make a decision, and we're going to move forward. And, and having heard him out, when I make my decision, he's going to back it up and he's going he's to throw his weight behind it. And that's, that's how we, we maintain our compositional velocity as a group. Which brings me to my last point. Like I said, it's really easy to spend a lot of time talking about story without producing actionable content, let alone an intelligent plan for how to take the work of the room out into the actual writing of the script and then from the script into actual content production. So you really do need a mechanism that holds your feet to the fire that says, okay, the time for conversation is over. We need to draw some lines in the sand and, and make some calls. <laughs> okay, so in ancient Greece, uh, there was this thing called the ostracon, which was a, basically a shard of pottery. And when a citizen offended his neighbors because he murdered someone or slept with somebody he shouldn't have or tried to overthrow the government, the citizenry would gather and vote by taking these ostraca and writing angrily the name of the person they didn't like anymore and casting it out. And if enough ostraca with your name on it were assembled, you would get exiled from the city for like 10 years. You'd have to move away. It's where we get the word ostracize. It's, it's a, a prototypical form of democracy in action. That's one way you could make decisions in a writer's room. Just kidding. That's a terrible idea. It's basically, it's the lead writer. But what I want to point out with this is, is it is not a democratic process. Healthy rooms have a culture of transparency where everybody has a voice but velocity is needed above all else. Production is king. You've got to hit your schedule. You've got to write to scope. The lead writer's responsibility is that. It's maintaining an awareness of uh, your overall content pipeline and your need to make decisions when. When you're looking at a story as complex as something like Before the Storm or the script that's as long as the Bible, you've got to have somebody with a hand on the rudder making, making these calls. And, and so the way that we worked is I charge my team to be as creative and imaginative as possible. I shape the conversation as we go, but I am making decisions as rapidly as I can. Here's the thing, you're gonna be wrong. I was wrong lots. Uh, you're gonna make the wrong call sometimes. 
you, you just want to be right most of the time. And you can't let waiting for certainty prevent you from being able to make some kind of a call and move forward with the story. Don't let the idea of the great, the ideal of the great, be the enemy of the good. And honestly, if you get it right like 85% of the time, you're a rock star. And your script's going to come out really well. Okay. So I'm going to end with one thought. Writing stories is hard. Writing interactive fiction is way harder. Writing collaboratively is, I think, the hardest thing. But when you're in a room, as a lead writer or a staff writer, you're there because you love storytelling. You have a joy about it. That's the only way that we would put up with what this career is like. <laughs> Remember that. Trust each other. Trust that joy. And whatever you end up producing will be spectacular. Thank you very much. OK. So I've got 10 minutes for questions if people want to ask anything. There are microphones. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, having worked both in a writer's room for television and for interactive fiction and games, what do you find are the similarities, and what do you find are the greatest differences? That's a, that's a giant question. So yeah, looking at TV and games, what are working in a writer's room for both, what are similar, what are different? Um, hmm. Needing to write discursively. When you're writing in games, you have to write with a mind toward branching structures. Depending on the type of game, the rigor of those structures will vary. But you're, you have to remember that when you're writing for a show, you're presenting something your audience watches. When you're writing for a game, you're presenting something your audience determines. Uh, they, they have agency in. And in the, writing, the way that you're writing it, you're sculpting that agency. So it's as if you have the player character in the room with you at all times, and you're imagining how the different elements of the story options that you're presenting will sort of influence them and their experience of, of navigating that. I honestly think it's, it's the hardest thing about writing games, and it's the thing that's most exciting, because we have no idea what we're doing with this still. We're still figuring out what it means, honestly, to have the consumer of a story practice agency in the development of that story. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, there we go. Uh, so I thought your um, words on crit critiquing junior writers' like habits was very insightful. I was wondering uh, if you had any other observations that you found that like a junior writer did something very like well uh, that might be applicable to other junior <laughs> writers uh, to learn from and improve. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, everyone can hear the questions from the mics. Yeah. Okay. Good. I don't need to repeat it. Um, one thing I love about working with new writers is that they haven't become jaded or cynical yet. Um, and and that's, that's, I mean, it's funny, um, but it's honestly true. Um, and, and I think ever, ever, outside of that, you get into a writer's room, it's because you're excellent. You've done something really well to get to that place. But at the same time, you're just, your education is about to begin, for real. Um, so I tell my junior writers, I want them to talk as much as anyone else. I want them to ask questions. I want them to get involved. I want them not to be afraid of failure uh, or looking stupid or any of that. But it's that enthusiasm that, that they, they really have going for them that, that I, find, I find joyful to work with. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, I was uh, wondering if you had any challenges working on the culture of, say, the writer's room versus the culture of the organization that you work for as a whole? Is it, were there, there are discrepancies between how you run a writer's room? Because we're, I work at a company where we're trying to establish writer's rooms and just, just the idea, um, how do you like merge the two uh, cultures, I guess? That's a, that's a really insightful question. Um, I mean, it varies, obviously, from what kind of organization you're in and what kind of room you want to have. Uh, at Deck Nine, the writing group is also the core design group. We have level designers who are much better at many kinds of design than we are, but we're narrative designers. We write code, we iterate on gameplay mechanics and things like that. Um, and because of that, we are essentially the start of the content pipeline. So we have a really autonomous culture in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think, like many elements of software development, the most important path forward is the one that works. So I think maintaining an agility of thought about 
what the writer's room needs for your needs, what kind of a culture it needs. Maybe that's contrary to the, the organization as a whole, and maybe that's totally okay. At the end of the day, is the room being effective or not? I think that's the question you want to ask, and if it's not, then be willing to reimagine it, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hey. I have a bit of a brain teaser, I guess. Uh, I teach game writing workshops with students, and my past policy was that everyone's even, and it's always the most painful part of the workshop to get these people to make a decision together when everyone's even. Uh, so would, you, would your suggestion be that maybe they vote for a leader, or do you think it's possible <laughs> for someone to create a story without a leader? Oof, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'm a big fan of teaching the way the work actually happens. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say elect a leader. Uh, voting it has its own challenges. Depending on the length of your class, the length of your semester, the segment of work, if it's a three-person team and you could do it, I would say have three pieces of work that they work on in three different phases and have each person uh, take the helm at, so everyone gets that experience. And that might be the most sort of equitable way to do it. Great, thank you. Yeah. You had uh, mentioned briefly that none of your writers had uh, game experience before. Yeah. Um, and beyond just being teachers, do you have any other uh, advice for what you look for or filter for when trying to make a speculative bet on a, a writer and whether they'll do well in this craft? Um, yeah, so I said kindness and humility. And, and I really do mean that. It sounds like kind of a trite thing, but it's not. Um, I think a demonstrated awareness and vocabulary around how to talk about story. And that doesn't, need to, that doesn't need to mean that you've published something. Um, that could mean that you've collaborated with a group very unsuccessfully to write something that never got off the ground, but you learned something from it. If I'm interviewing someone and they're talking about that experience and I hear that you know, in their language and, and how they talk about it, that they thought about what that was for them, that they're capable of sort of engaging that critical thought about those processes, that gets me excited. That, that makes me think, okay, this is someone who I could learn from, this is someone I can teach, uh, and, and I'll give that person a closer look. That's, that's me, and thank, thank you. So I just want to say we have two minutes until I think I need to disappear, um, but I'm not gonna just actually take it to the wrap-up room. Yeah, so I'm gonna go down the hall um, to the wrap-up room. It's basically at the end on the left, and I'll be sitting at a table, and if anyone has any more questions, and you want to or just introduce yourselves, please uh, come, come to talk with me. I'll be there for about an hour. Thank you so much, everybody.